Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the U.S. Commercial Service, the International Trade Administration, and the Connecticut District Export Council, we welcome all of you to today's program, Managing Current and Future PFAS Challenges in Food, Beverages, and Packaging. And I apologize for having some bandwidth issues today. So you either can hear me or see me, but unfortunately cannot do both. <laughs> so that is why I'm not on video today. Um, my name is Jacqueline Torsolini. I'm a Senior International Trade Specialist with the U.S. Commercial Service in Connecticut. I'm the host for today's session. And I'm happy to have Melissa Grasso, the Connecticut State Director for the U.S. Commercial Service joining me today. And of course, our two presenters, uh, Attorney Alfredo Fernandez of Shipman and Goodwin LLP, who's also a member of the Connecticut District Export Council, and Dr. Lisa Navarro of Ramble Health Sciences Consulting. Before we get to the pr presentation, a couple of items to note. This program is being recorded. If you are not comfortable with being part of a recorded program, we politely ask you to exit the program at this time. Uh, we could take questions through the question and answer uh, panel, which you'll find at the bottom right-hand side of your screen where the three dots are. If you click on that, you will see the Q&A open up or you can put things in to the chat box as well. Uh, I will send an email out before the end of the week, which will include the slide deck and recording of today's program. The views and opinions expressed in this presentation made by our speakers may not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the U.S. government. And for those of you who are not familiar with, I'd like to just take a minute to tell you a little bit about the U.S. Commercial Service. We are the trade and investment arm of the U.S. federal government, a division of the International Trade Administration. Our mission is to promote U.S. exports, protect U.S. commercial interests abroad, and facilitate foreign direct investment into the United States. We have a global reach. Our domestic field consists of over 100 offices around the country, and we have offices in over 75 countries around the world located at U.S. embassies and consulates. Uh, here is a brief slide about some of the services that we offer. And at the end of the slide deck, you will find contact information to the specialists here in our Connecticut office. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our two presenters. So Alfredo Fernandez is with Shipman and Goodwin, and he advises the regional and national manufacturing technology education and real estate organizations with a focus on environmental and international trade matters. He serves as the chair of the firm's manufacturing team and is the chair of the diversity, equity and inclusion committee. As a member of the firm's national environmental practice, Alfredo advises clients across industry types on environmental health and safety issues that arise in all areas of business operations, including regulatory compliance, transactional due diligence, management and remediation of contaminated properties, dispute resolution, crisis management and property transfer laws. One area of focus is industrial and specialty chemical compliance in which Alfredo, Alfredo guides clients through market evaluation, product registration, hazard communication and labeling. And in addition, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lisa Navarro, who is principal of Ramble's Environment and Health Division Consulting Arm. Uh, Dr. Navarro is an accomplished and performance-driven professional with extensive experience in managing product safety and regulatory assurance programs, employing strategic leadership and effective decision-making. 
She has over 75 years of experience with regulations that impact home and personal care products, food and flavoring ingredients, food packaging, agricultural, biocidal products, over-the-counter drug products, and medical devices. She has her doctorate in toxicology from Florida A&M University, and she holds memberships, memberships in the Society of Toxicology, the Toxicology Forum, American Board of Toxicology, European Registration of Toxicologists, and the Toxicology Education Foundation. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Alfredo and Lisa to begin their programming. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Appreciate the, the nice introductions and we'll jump uh, into it. We have a lot of good content uh, for the group today and we'll have a little Q&A time at the end here. Um, you got the, the nice bio, so we'll, uh, we'll skip a couple slides in here. Topic of today is how PFAS are already and, and will uh, potentially be affecting the food and beverage sector, and in particular, um, the packaging piece of that will be a, a big part of our conversation today. We've clipped a couple relatively recent within the last few years, including some as, as recent as, as last week or so, headlines from various you know, um, articles and things in the news all really relating to PFAS and, and in particular food safety issues uh, re relating PFAS. And we'll get into a little PFAS background in case this is the first time um, you're stepping through the joy of, of learning what, what the letters PFAS stand for and what they mean. Uh, but needless to say, this is a, a growing uh, level of, of public awareness, consumer awareness for purposes of, um, of a food safety concern, just given the, the um, the, the current knowledge of, of these PFAS chemicals and expect to see more PFAS headlines in the news now that you're, uh, you'll, be a, you'll leave here a little more attuned to those issues. So we're talking about PFAS, PFAS, what's all that PFAS about? The PFAS stands for poly and polyfluoroalkyl alkyl substances. These were man-made, uh, are man-made groups of, or a group of man-made chemicals from decades ago um, and at the time, they came out and were really wonderful products for the consumer base and industrial base in terms of what they could do for coatings and, and nonstick applications and moisture resistance. Um, and they really uh, became uh, an ubiquitous type of product just via the, the commercial use, um, whether household type products or, or in industry. You know, decades later, fast forward. It's becoming more and more known that those that group of PFAS chemicals do have some environmental impacts, are associated with some health concerns, and the regulators, state, federal, and internationally, are also paying a lot more attention, starting to take a lot more um, action with regard to regulating PFAS and, and reducing exposure uh, to not only the environment but also uh, human consumption for for human health. On the environmental side, you know it. it it does get into soil, all different types of water um, in, in various you know, water type media, whether it's, it's rivers or drinking water, et cetera, and can get dispersed through the air um, through factories and things like that. It does affect other types of natural resources, animals, and relatively uh, well-preserved natural areas, including um, undeveloped forests on Mount Everest in Antarctica. Uh, they've, they've found these PFAS. They're, they're regulated at, at very, very low levels, whereas traditional contaminants are, are measured in concentrations of parts per million or parts per billion, PFAS are measured on the scale of parts per trillion, uh, just to give you the order of magnitude of, of how, how fine the, um, the concentrations of those PFAS can go down to. In terms of human health impacts, uh, the, the body of scientific research is evolving, but there are some um, studies pointing to potential health impacts. We won't necessarily get into all the uh, nitty gritty uh, health impacts for purposes of today's presentation, which is more focused on, on the food and beverage sector and the regulations and things to be looking at there. Uh, but needless to say, the human health impact is a lot of what's driving the, the increased regulation when it comes to PFAS. From an exposure perspective, one of the, the main concerns is that the ubiquitous nature of it affects the food chains and drinking water uh, and then gets absorbed uh, or get consumed 
uh, up the food chain, including humans, um, and that that bio burden is is the health risk there. So I tried to squeeze in the the uh, the basics of PFAS into one slide in a couple minutes here to level set a little bit for folks that are experienced with PFAS and folks that may be uh, learning about it for the first time today. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa for a bit here to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the, the history and, and some of the current health research. So, hi, yeah, so, yeah, th there's a little bit of history here on, on PFOS and the family of, of chemistries that this represents. So, going back to 1998, um, 3M was the primary manufacturer at that time of, of PFOS and notified the agency, the EPA, that, um, that they had found, you know, white, the, the material widespread in the environment as well as in um, the blood of some of its employees as well as um, the general population around some of its manufacturing facilities. Um, you know, as a result of that notification and some additional research, 3M voluntarily phased out of the kind of the historical substances, the PFOA and the PFOS. Um, and subsequent to that, the EPA actually issued a SNR for 75 um, members of the PFAS family, um, which is now about 14,000 different chemistries. Um, all um, falling in different um, lanes of definition. Um, and then most recently, 3M, 3M has uh, announced that it's going to phase out all PFOS um, manufacturing um, by the end of 2025. So this has been a, a kind of a long, um, a long journey uh, for, for these chemistries, and it's not going to be an easy journey. These chemistries, as Alfredo was saying, they're ubiquitous and they have you know, they had phenomenal properties. So grease resistance, oil resistance, friction resistance, um, high temperature resistance. And so they're used in just about everything. And I'll get to that. So yeah. if we can go on the next slide. Sure. And as we're switching here, a little homework for everybody after this is to watch the movie Dark Waters uh, with Mark Ruffalo and Anne Hathaway that kind of explains a little bit of that discovery back in, in that time frame that Lisa just had and, and how these kind of became a known a known thing outside of, of 3M. So with the disclosure from 3M to the EPA, the CDC added um, some of the PFOS chemistries, so four PFOS chemistries, to their series of chemistries that they um, test for in the participants um, of the um, NHANES program, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And um, they have found PFOS in nearly every um, person that participates in this um, chemistry uh, sampling. Right now, the CDC tests for over 400 chemistries, and um, you know the results um, that they started obtaining from this these assays have shown that you know we do have this widespread exposure of PFOS um, in the U.S. population, and you know based on what we are seeing with uh, global regulatory. Um, action that this is a global um, PFOS exposure um, scenario. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, human health effects to date from exposure to low levels of PFOS are really uncertain. And so while they're finding the materials in, in blood, they really um, have, you know, struggled to make a direct connection to human adverse human health effects. And so, um, that takes us to the next slide where the ATSDR and the CDC, you know, two of our government agencies, you know, have really been looking at, um, you know, assessing the PFOS blood levels, looking at that in comparison to um, kind of the, the historical PFOS compounds, which you'll see along the bottom axis, ax, axis of this graph that, you know, from 1999-2000, um, the levels of the PFOA, and the other associated um, uh, compounds have really been at, at low levels um, and that the PFOS um, has also come down. But what we aren't able to ascertain at this time is really um, the, the levels of the other thousands of chemistries that are out there that are members of this PFOS family. The analytical methodologies are just not there yet. I know for Looking in food, they have they can assay for less than a hundred of the thousands of PFOS family members that are out there. 
and the same um, limitations exist for analyzing for PFOS in other matrices as well. Um, if you look at, yeah, the list of possible human health effects, you know, there are a lot of subtle changes, so very, um, very few overt, um, you know, associations with the presence of PFOS and a direct, you know, adverse event that, which is something you more typically see when you, um, you know, we're talking about chemistry and, and toxicology type endpoints. So we can move on. Sure. Is there anything else you wanted to add to this? Yeah, yeah just a, a quick note. One of the important takeaways for scale here is that the, the Haynes study has shown, you know, either a stabilization or a decrease over the last two or so decades at the parts per billion scale, that that's just what our bodies on average are carrying. And the regulations are, you know, a thousand times lower than, uh, than what are already in our bodies already. So we're really dealing with, uh, yeah, some some interesting scales with the parts per billion baseline of, of the human body over you know just from from the exposure of living regular life to the PPT parts per trillion scale of of where these things are being looked at now. And so you know the data coming out of, of NHANES and the kind of the global response to PFOS, um, we're seeing a lot of activity across the the U.S. at different state levels, and so. Um, on the right-hand side of this uh, slide, you'll see uh, categories, biomonitoring, biosolids, artificial turf, cookware, food packaging, plastics, school items. And so each of these titles is actually, it's a category of legislative activity that's taking place in all of these states with the, some form of green shading in them. Um, and so some have already policies in place um, and others are in the in the middle of adopting policies. Um, the most restrictive, of course, has been Maine and um, Minnesota. So Maine has a a, a regulatory uh, process in place that will effectively ban all PFOS chemistries in all applications um, effective 2030. So that's a quick seven years from now. And then conversations that I've had with polymer chemists. Um, engineers that, you know, design materials, you know, EpiPens and packaging, they are at a loss for substitute materials. So this is going to be an interesting um, challenge as we work towards, a, you know, a PFOS free, if you will, free um, environment as well as a society where we're not able to use these chemistries. Um, so this takes us so kind of specifically if we drill down into some of these states and what's going on at a more granular level. Certainly, I think what's important to the group on this call is food packaging. So there's 14 states that have some form of food packaging regulation. Um, and they vary from, you know, whether it's direct added or indirect, um, they vary in terms of their the way they're enforcing the rules. So California's already gone live with their regulation and it was effective immediately with no grandfathering at all for any packaging that might be in commerce at the at the um, onset of, of the regulation, which was the January 1st of this, this year. Um, other states have different timelines where they're, um, you know, embarking on, a, on regulations against certain uh, food packaging materials, primarily in the paper and paperboard arena but some states have been more general in their um, definitions of impacted food packaging materials. And then within water, you see um, certainly the EPA has come out with different um, MCL levels. Um, some states are um, adopting the enforceable standards for the maximum contaminant levels. So these are the states listed on the right-hand side of the water section. So Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, and so forth. And then um, the states on the left have actually adopted um, guidance levels or notification levels. So one's enforceable and one is advisory. And so you've got different states approaching PFOS and water with different ways of working. So if you've got manufacturing facilities and, and bridging the gap between these states, you've got different regulations in place for how you're trying to you know, prepare for these uh, regulations and, and design your facilities and mitigate for PFOS. 
And then the big one that we see a lot of, of course, is firefighting foam. You know, a lot of people see these pictures and they think, well, you know, I'm not a firefighter. I'm not around fire um, all that often. But most large scale manufacturers have fire suppression systems and, and fire um, mitigation systems in place, um, many of which um, do contain the AFFF type um, firefighting materials, or they may be materials that you have on site. And so I'm seeing in a lot of due diligence um, projects where, um, you know, if you've had a fire on your site and you've used PFOS firefighting foams in the past, that this is a source of potential, um, uh, in, you know, contamination of your facility with PFOS that you may not even be aware of or think twice about because it was something that maybe took place, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Yep. And I, I, we hadn't really thought about that, but as we were talking, Lisa, I'll make a uh, an example uh, observation here. And, and while the focus of today isn't necessarily the firefighting foam, but we do have a lot of food and beverage folks on the line. And um, we had a, a, a transaction issue a, a couple of years ago where a, a former food manufacturing facility that has a you know, chocolate and coconut type food product um, had prior fires in the um, in the facility due to the roasting of, of the coconut in that particular space and they had used the fire suppression system at, as appropriately you know to, to deal with the fire emergency but that did affect the whole facility and really uh, created some issues when they were trying to sell um, sell that property with a history of an AFFF um, extinguishing event and the buyer wanted nothing to do with it and uh, really complicated the transaction. So, you know, one of the things we'll get into later is a little bit of how, how PFAS are affecting transactions and, and those kind of things for, for food and beverage companies. That's just one example that, that came to mind, even though it's not a food packaging issue directly, it is PFAS affecting the sector. Absolutely. So if we want to go on the next slide. So if you're if you're feeling isolated that you're in the food industry, um, you're they're regulating packaging, you know, don't fear isolation because the cosmetic industry, the textile industry, and in some cases all industries are kind of are being pulled into this um, PFAS um, mitigation um, exercise. Um, so cos some states already have bans for its use in cosmetics. So again, it's water waterproof or waterproofing uh, characteristics, um, you know, make it a nice material for use in cosmetics. It's uh, again for textiles. So your, your Gore-Tex style rain jackets with the water resistant, water repellent um, surfaces. Um, those are in most cases, PFOS related chemistries and that you think of it, your stain resistant carpets, your stain resistant apparel, um, your stain resistant furniture fabrics, that's all PFOS um, related um, applications. Again, back to the firefighting. So it's not only in the foam, but it's also in the gear for the same principles we talked about. It's got heat, heat tolerance and water resistance. Um, so it makes it a good uh, agent for a sur surface agent for the firefighting um, textiles. And then, of course, um, a few states have taken um, aggressive um, positions against PFOS in all applications. Kind of that was list, really listed about two slides ago, uh, looking at you know all the different areas of PFOS um, use and you know what's taking place. I'll turn it back. I think are you up for the next? Yeah. Slide? Okay. Yes. Uh, so, you know, kind of drilling down a little further into some of these industry targeted uh, bans and restrictions. Right? A lot of our, the core of our content, you know, is is focused on food packaging and, and the recent bans that came out at the state level. And we'll, we'll put a more general chart on the next slide, but um, and I won't necessarily talk to all of these details uh, on this slide, but the the various states, I think on the order of 12, don't, don't quote me on that, I'll, I'll go count my list later, uh, in the, uh, individual states have passed actual state statutes that ban the intentional use of, of PFAS in food packaging product. And all of these laws kind of started from the same DNA. There's this um, advisory group called the Toxics and Packaging Clearinghouse, and they create model legislation as a starting point. And then each state legislature, you know, tweaked here and, and nipped that and tucked that uh, to, to get 
through their own you know, respective state legislative process so that the, our end result was 12 similar but slightly different in every, you know, in each way um, laws banning the intentionally added PFAS in food packaging. A number of those states already have that ban in effect. So if you are selling food or beverage products into those states, that law is effective today and has been, for in some cases, has been since uh, December 31st of last year. And then this coming uh, New Year's, December 31st and January 1st, has a bunch of new states taking effect of that group. Uh, so for purposes of, of states, you know, a single state market, you know, you, you want to look at your state, but in most cases, um, selling into multiple states is the norm. Uh, so you do have to be aware of, of all your customers and, and where your food products go because these packaging uh, products, PFAS and product bans uh, may apply to you. By way of example, um, you know, Vermont's law does, well, let me take a step back. Some laws are focused on specific materials for packaging, such as plant-based or fiber-based products, kind of the paper uh, to-go salad containers and pizza boxes and those uh, boats that you, know, you put your French fries in and have that nice glossy uh, layer there. Uh, that glean is potentially a PFAS containing coating. Uh, so they focused on things like that that need that grease and moisture and oil resistance uh, in the food packaging you know, world for years. Other states have not necessarily limited their bans to those paper-based products. The ban applies to all, um, all types of food packaging. And there's some variation on whether it, it makes direct contact with the food or it's just in, in the packaging generally, even on the exterior. Of a of a thing, some states are specific to uh, to the exact types of packaging they're regulating, and others are very vague uh, by design. So, like I said, they all started from the same DNA, the same model legislation, but in effect, or the laws that got into effect on various states have some subtle differences, uh, but a lot are 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 awfully similar. So you can kind of generally state uh, all these state laws are are banning. Um, intentionally added PFAS. We'll get into a couple exceptions here in a, in a few slides as well. Uh, here's, oh, I'm switching slides on my wrong screen here. Lisa, before we move, any anything specific to call out on this slide for us? Uh, no, I think kind of the highlight that we'll hit on a later slide is really that California's um, threshold for unintentional addition of PFAS and some of the implications that that will have with, you know, recycled goods and, and, you know, really understanding, you know, your supply chain. And so just we'll touch on a few few of those kind of hot elements as we get through uh, some of our later slides. Okay, here's uh, you know, something all right, my team put together and, and updates from from time to time that kind of lays out the timeline. You could see New York, Washington, California, Vermont already in effect. And then less than two months, a whole bunch um, come into effect as well. Some are some are paper and plant-based material specific. And if you know that's useful if, if you make packaging without those materials, but the blue boxes here do apply to all. They're not limited to those. Uh, so a, a, a big mix and, and kind of handling all the nuances and there's some definitional differences in all the, the laws we've looked at in a granular level that we won't get into today. Uh, but some variation and, and that adds some complexity with a, a multi-state customer and distribution base. Uh, Lisa, is this your slide or do you want to jump in here? I'm certainly happy, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so kind of going back to those analytical challenges. So when you see PFOS in a product and there's the regulation is that um, unintentionally added PFOS needs to be less than 100 parts per million. And the analytical method that's out there is based on total organic fluorine. And so what that's doing is it's very non-specific. It's for any compound that contains a fluorine molecule. Um, and the reason why this has been promulgated this way is, as I mentioned before, there's very few specific methodologies for testing for all of the different PFOS compounds. And so 
California has defaulted to using this this um, 100 ppm threshold. And so it's, um, yeah, it doesn't allow you to distinguish between um, allowed and not allowed food contact substances. So kind of in direct contrast to what's going on at the state levels, at the federal level, there are still, and we'll get to this, there are still um, uh, permitted authorized food contact substances. And so food contact substances are those materials that are on the surfaces um, of articles used to package food or to process food. Um, and so having regulations without appropriate specific analytical methods um, really um, makes it a challenge for, um, you know, having enforceable standards. And, you know, what does this mean really for all of the fluoropolymers and food contact? So I leave that as an open question. So, you know, are we going to see action by the agency, the FDA in this case, at a, a secondary request to remove further from the market additional fluoropolymers? Or will they be allowed to stay on and the states can take action in contrast to authorizations that are granted at the federal level? So we've got a bit of a, a headbutting here of, of regula regulations and approaches to PFOS and food packaging for sure. Um, and then the unintentionally added, again, kind of going back to this, um, you know, different states have different definitions of what unintentional and intentional means. Um, and the biggest source of unintentionally added materials is going to come in from your, from water. And so um, your municipal water, uh, based on what we've seen reports from the EPA that nearly every municipal water system in the country has detectable levels of PFAS. And so if you follow the water, you'll follow the PFAS. So is that intentionally added or unintentionally added? So definitely have some challenges ahead to um, you know, figure out how we're going to A, assay for PFAS for the appropriate PFASs and develop appropriate specific analytical methods to, you know, help us along this journey. So yeah. I mentioned a little bit on the food context. I would, uh, I thought, do you have additional comments? Yeah, just, just to highlight and underscore some of the, the, uh, the complicated analysis here on, on figuring out what's, what's actually banned in some states and maybe not in others. And, um, you know, for example, Rhode Island, uh, by way of a representative example here does, um, consider things, PFAS that are used as processing aids to be um, intentionally added for purposes of the packaging product mm -hmm. when other states kind of carve out processing aids, even because they're not necessarily added to help the product with its grease resistance or, or moisture or, or uh, oil resistant properties. So even some of those distinctions can, can swing it one way or the other, depending on what state uh, you're looking at, just based on how the laws came out and how agency guidance to the extent uh, the state has provided any ag agency guidance um, can also kind of push push the analysis one way or the other. But uh, no no easy answer and no universal answer across the the laws that we do have. And that that actually adds another thought to me that you know, when you say processing aids for PFAS, some people may think like, okay, so we added intentionally, it's an environmental contaminant. Now, what is this use as a processing aid? Well, because of its its kind of friction resistance uh, properties, sometimes like you can imagine it's blown through equipment to lubricate the line so that as a release agent, so that if you're gonna put run, you know, you could run polypropylene through the system, which is a, you know, a plastic that does not contain PFOS, but you, it might be adhering to the surfaces of your polypropylene materials that you run through this, this system. It's also, if you've got dye, you know, colors in your packaging, um, it can be a flow agent in dye mixes. So it's, you know, it's added as a processing aid, a flow agent um, ends up in the packaging. So yeah, there's lots of, lots of channels for, for PFOS to, to show up in. So it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a very complex um, system and complex puzzle that we'll be sorting out here over the, probably the next, probably the rest of my lifetime. And you know, for the folks that are, are are food makers on the webinar, we fully appreciate that you may not know exactly how your packaging was made, but we'll get into in a few slides here how to deal with your supply chain as an important kind of compliance 
uh, strategy with, with the current regulatory landscape. So I touched briefly on food contact notifications. So um, earlier in January of 2022, the FDA actually promulgated a new rule, which is in this fuzzy blue box on the left, that basically they allowed for the agency to rescind authorizations on food contact notifications in the future for reasons other than safety, which is a, a big kind of turn from the typical approach that the FDA uses for um, revoking authorizations of anything. Um, and so what we're seeing is a change in the regulatory approach. I put the PB without the T. So for those of you that aren't toxicologists, that's persistence and bioaccumulation, but with really without the toxicology, that, that, that overt toxic endpoint is, is really is still, you know, something to be sorted out. Um, but yet the, at this time, prior to that, that regulation um, with the original SNR, the FDA, um, so the original EPA SNR, the FDA encouraged um, numerous corporations to withdraw their food contact notifications. And this happened with for 22 food contact notifications that had chemistries that, that aligned with the original 75 chemistries that the EPA um, removed from commerce um, back in 2002. We saw this happen. We saw 22 food contact notifications also removed from commerce. But if we go on to the next slide, what's interesting is we still got 52 food contact substances that are still authorized. Um, and so this is just a screenshot from the FDA um, website. Um, and so it, it just begs the question, you know, are these going to be available for con continued use? Um, and if so, for how long or will there be subsequent um, withdrawals from the marketplace, um, either under the new rule that the FDA has put forth or through voluntary requests from the agency to the uh, manufacturers to remove these from the marketplace. And I don't have an answer to that question, but it's, it, it certainly is one to watch to see how this is going to unfold. And so I can finish up here. We did talk about unintentionally um, or non, yeah, non-intentionally added PFOS and just kind of really thinking about what that means. Um, so we've touched on most of this. So yep, the processing aids, um, some states include PFOS as a processing aid, other states exclude it in terms of whether it's intentional or unintentional. Um, we touched on the water. So a, a recent publication um, has reported that at least one type of PFOS may be present in up to 45% of drinking water in the US. And that piece of PFOS is persistent um, in soil, water, and crops. Um, we're seeing um, challenges with farmers that have received biosolids for land application or now have, you know, responsibility and for either runoff into waterways and or uptake into crop material. Um, and then, you know, a big one is this post-consumer recycled materials. So there's been a lot of effort to reuse, to recycle and reuse paper goods. And this is going to be a large um, potential source of, of PFAS re-entering the food packaging market. So, um, you know, if you're using recycled materials in your packaging, this is going to be an avenue that you'll want to investigate to understand how this supply chain um, impacts your, your packaging materials. I think I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, no, I got this one too. So certificates of compliance. So seems like it's a maybe a get out of jail free card. So sorry, Alfredo, but um, that, that's not legal advice. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of states um, have gone to um, suggesting that you request supplier attestations that affirm that your products meet legal requirements whatever those may be for the different states. So um, if you're in the food industry, I know this all too well. I, before joining Ramble, I was in the food ingredient industry for 10 years. And there is a questionnaire or an affidavit or an attestation for everything. Um, if something happens in the world, if you're a food manufacturer, you know they want an attestation that you're not sourcing 
or you're not sole sourced from a single location that might jeopardize your supply chain. This is the same in the same kind of um, kind of thought process where if you can obtain from your suppliers attestations that say that they're not intentionally adding PFOS to their products, or if they are adding PFOS to just disclose what they're adding and where they're adding it so that you're ready for whatever that next legal requirement might be because you've got some states that have rules and other states that don't have rules. Hopefully we'll see some type of a melding of the rules and we'll have one, one approach across the country for managing PFOS. But in the meantime, it's, it's going to be a bit of a piecemeal exercise where you'll need to manage your vendors very carefully and you're going to have to manage that documentation coming back to you. So it's definitely a burdensome activity um, that you need to really think about and prepare for. Yep, and a lot of you know retail uh, food businesses, grocery stores, et cetera, are are pushing that question or a series of questions up their supply chain. And if if those are your customers, you may have already received that kind of letter, um, and you do have some responsibility now to to push your supply chain to give you those answers so that you can answer to your customer appropriately. And, um, and for example, our, our second bullet here, there's at, at least one of those state laws has a requirement to, to get some information from your supply chain, uh, you know, universe with, with on paper um, as to their, their ability to comply in another state, for example, New York has this, what we unofficially call a safe Harbor or the law there, the hazardous, Packaging Act in New York that's been around for a while. It's just updated to include PFAS. Um, has this uh, provision that if you do get um, a, a writing from your supplier that that checks the boxes of four or five criteria, that you you'll be essentially won't be deemed out of compliance with the law if, if you go get these um, certifications from your from your packaging supplier. So there's um, a, a good liability mitigation technique to go uh, secure that with uh, with your supply chain vendors and suppliers. I think we have, if we wanna hop to the next slide. So then, you know, we've covered most of this, but just kind of revisiting, thinking about your facility, your food production facility, and some of the environmental compliance challenges that you might be um, maybe not quite aware of or haven't really thought of yet, but because of the multifaceted um, regulations and the lack of harmonization um, and because we, you know, we're expecting to see, you know, more and more disclosure laws coming down the path, um, we'll see more uh, in, in consumer facing um, establishments, you know, wanting to make, you know, PFAS free type claims. So we've seen this certainly from like sporting goods stores and grocery store chains. Um, so, you know, thinking about where, where you're exposed um, you know, water, water, water. I can't emphasize that one enough. Um, you know, it's coming in drinking water. It's in your process water. Um, it's in your fire suppression systems. Um, and so really being mindful of trying to at least early stage identify where all your, um, your exposure points are for potential sources of PFOS entering your supply chain or entering your, you know, finished goods chain. Um, so that you're prepared to um, understand what type of mitigation plans that you'll need to put in place as the regulations evolve um, and as, you know, as compliance rules come online. That's right. Any... Oh, no. So, and, and that's all very important beyond just the packaging in the food product or beverage product you put out to the world. As Lisa said, just the operation of your facility presents a lot of separate you know, kind of PFAS considerations for overall environmental compliance. And those apply even if there's no transaction in your future. If you're good on status quo and business is good and you're going to continue operating, it is a good idea to do that. Um, we'll transition here a little bit to where a transaction is in your future, whether you're looking to uh, sell or buy or you know, an M&A type of transaction if you're growing or um, a family business looking to, to sell what you've built. Uh, there are some transactional considerations that that are important beyond just the the packaging um, discussion that that we've discussed. In terms of the phase one uh, environmental site assessment, that's a common uh, 
a common non-invasive uh, assessment when uh, when a transaction is is in the works during due diligence to understand the potential soil and groundwater issues there. There's been a, a proposed rule to make two of those PFAS substances, the PFOA and the PFOS, the quote unquote hazardous substances for purposes of the federal CERCLA uh, contamination and remediation law. Uh, in that case, the, the consultants doing that uh, due diligence will have to identify uh, potential instances where, where PFAS these two PFAS uh, chemistries could be a concern. And the, uh, the, the, the leading standard, the ASTM um, standard for phase one assessments has recently evolved, is starting to uh, cover PFAS in terms of uh, including them in, in the standard uh, assessment. And, and we're seeing a lot of consultants um, before these hazardous substances designations um, are actually formally applied at the federal level. They're still addressing PFAS. This was called the business environmental risk. So it's a little bit out of out of the traditional scope, but they don't want to ignore it. So we're seeing the PFAS assessment come into phase ones uh, more and more often. And um, and often we're you know when we're working with a consultant, we're we're pushing that to in a buyer type of position because we want to know if would there potentially be PFAS risk after our client buys this site or this business. On the phase two side, and, and phase two for those not necessarily in the environmental space, involves invasive sampling to collect data uh, from soil and groundwater or air. Um, and in that case, there's there's some interesting strategic questions to be addressed. Um, what are you gonna What are you gonna sample? Which exact PFAS compounds are you gonna sample for? Which laboratory methods are you gonna use? As, as Lisa mentioned, there's only a a few approved methods for for overall PFAS um, sampling in, in the lab, and then what are you going to do with this data? Most of the states don't necessarily have enforceable soil or groundwater contamination standards, so you're going to have data, but not really sure what to do with it, and you're going to have to make a bit of a business, legal, operational uh, risk decision when you do get the data. If sellers want to be careful uh, with allowing PFAS sampling to happen. If you're allowing a buyer to do due diligence and they test PFAS and it's off the charts, then you're left as the owner of that property or that business with that knowledge. Uh, but the buyer can, can generally walk away if, if they don't like what they see, but you get stuck with, with that knowledge. So there are some strategic decisions in the context of a transaction that, uh, that you want to uh, keep in mind. You know, for example, it, it won't necessarily linger on in the interest of time here, uh, but as a buyer, you kind of want to understand the history of of the current use of the site, but also what used to happen on on this real estate. Was there a prior factory that's been redeveloped that may have stuff underneath the building that I I may up I may create my own liability by buying the site based on um, on prior use on the, and the you know in the food sector specifically if if it's agricultural land. Understanding the biosolids uses, as, as Lisa mentioned, uh, biosolids are a growing area of, of interest as a, a kind of a heavy PFAS source that gets spread across agricultural land. Understanding your drinking water, if there's wells on the site, et cetera, um, and, and whether any reporting might be necessary under under some new federal laws as well. And I would I would just jump in and add. I know the majority of due diligence tracks transactions and reviews are focused on the ASTM requirements, which is the environmental side. But, you know, keep in mind that, um, you know, having some high level product due diligence reviews, if you're, you know, especially in the food food space or in the packaging space, to really have somebody take a look at the, you know, the, the target supply chain and what, you know, what right might really be in the systems there so that you're fully informed. Absolutely. And then, you know, we, since we are uh, working with the U.S. Commercial Service and the District Export Councils here, we did want to, of course, include some international uh, considerations here that are becoming more and more uh, relevant in, in, in our practice. On the import side, food importers, you essentially put all that burden on yourself by being the importer, no matter what's going on with your foreign food suppliers, whether you're buying packaging internationally or you're buying the ready-to-go turnkey food product, and you're just eff effectively a, a, a distributor kind of role in that case um, under TSCA and the state rules that we've dis uh, that we've discussed. TSCA being uh, 
kind of a, a chemical registration rule at the federal level, the importers effectively consider the manufacturer. So what would apply to any kind of domestic manufacturer would normally apply to you as as an importer. So you have to make sure you're, you know, if you are distributing foreign made products, that those are in compliance too, just because you didn't actively make them. Um, or if you're you're buying uh, your packaging from a foreign um, supplier and then wrapping or, or packaging your food product in the States, you need to be aware of that. There are some language barrier issues with that. There are some uh, just overall knowledge of, of the PFAS scientific uh, state of play issues where we're dealing with um, somewhat underdeveloped markets as in the supply chain, kind of really understanding what some of those certifications we mentioned before are, are actually asking for. So it's not necessarily as easy as sending an email with a form to say, check this box and sign. Um, it, it is a challenge when you're dealing with um, with foreign markets and on your supply chain side. And, and maybe before I, I leave, uh, Lisa, you could jump in with, with what the new Tosca rule kind of entails, if, if you're familiar with that. And um, off script. And uh, on the export side, um, it, it is, you know, one of the messages we're probably trying to convey here is that it, it's, it's tough to just get our grip, uh, our arms around the the patchwork of state rules, the overlay of the federal rules, the crystal ball exercise of where might PFAS regulation be going just in the United States. But then when you add in foreign customers, if you are selling overseas, you need to be aware of what those foreign jurisdictions are looking at. And, and the world is is not even uh, when it comes to, to PFAS regulation. However, we will note that the EU is very active, very hot on 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 PFAS, and you know they kind of um, go back and forth as to you know which which path they're going to take. Uh, but if you are selling into the EU in particular, you do want to be aware of of what those PFAS restrictions would be as well, which is a a, a bit of a burden to um, to export your U.S. made product over there. Yeah, just briefly on on, on Tosca that it's retroactive so they're looking back 12 years worth of data and um it's got specific i'm not an expert on the tosca reporting rule but it, it's from what i've seen it's it's 12 years um, retroactive um it's focused mainly on things that would be under tosca regulations so chemistries and articles that would be imported containing pfos and that it goes into effect believe later this month or early next month and it's it goes you've got 12 months for compliance so it's it's a fast moving um target and it's not going to be easy for those that are subject to the rule um paper keeping from 12 years back is probably not everybody's best uh process um especially after the couple years of covid where supply chains were just scrambling to get materials just to get products made so um, but it's definitely, um, t take a look at it. If you go onto the EPA website, you should be able to download the details of the rule and, and understand, you know, if there's specific areas, uh, um, that might impact your, um, business. Yeah. And that, yeah, that one could be a big one. It's eff effectively the government saying, you need to tell us all the PFAS you've imported, mm -hmm. uh, for, for some number of years, and that'll grow the number of, of companies subject to that rule that usually don't necessarily get too involved in, in anything Tusco related. So mm -hmm. this rule just dropped last week or two weeks ago. So it is, is relatively new. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over our, the list litigation slide, but needless to say a couple of food and beverage companies, mostly the big ones right now have been sued for, for their packaging, uh, content of PFAS in the packaging content, um, or kind of how they describe their product as, all natural or, or organic, but then PFAS are found in the food product itself. So from a legal litigation risk perspective, very real. Haven't seen it really hit the small, medium food makers yet, probably because the pockets aren't as deep. Uh, but we did just want to flag that as as a legal risk of, of PFAS that's taking shape. And we expect PFAS litigation across the board to to increase in the coming years. So as we, we bring it home here, our, our last Two slides are, are kind of our recommendation jointly, um, a legal and technical risk assessment where uh, you know, it, it is advisable to look inward, understand where PFAS inputs could be coming into your overall product value chain, whether it is 
uh, from an agricultural field, if that's relevant to your, um, you know, to your to your business, to the equipment you use, to transportation, to you know, cleaning lines, to the source water, and, and you know, on-site water you may be using, um, cleaning ingredients, etc. Understand where could PFAS come into into my um, into my product, and packaging is, is one of those, but not the only one. And then understand where your risk points are based on your your customer base, what jurisdictions are in play, um, and and just kind of get that um, inward looking assessment taken care of, and and identify strong points and and some weak points, right, and address those accordingly. Um, and we'll give an example on on the next slides of of how we did it. It's not necessarily a, a set it and forget it type of report. It is an evolving living document because it, the state laws continue to, to roll out the relevant standards and levels and, and methods continue to evolve. Uh, so it, it will never be final. It will be a, an ongoing, you know, chronically updated type of, of risk management plan. Yep. And so we'll, in closing, our last substantive slide here is just a case study uh, to, to kind of put that recommendation with a little more, um, with a little more specifics, we worked with a multi-state agricultural company um, and engaged the environmental health and safety consultant through the law firm to help with the attorney-client privilege as we were providing legal advice for for all of this, you know, PFAS legal uh, risk. And we evaluated in their case, uh, you know, their their farm processes, how they brought on feed for their animals, et cetera, uh, how they were transporting, how they were running. Their product through various factories and, and moving it from you know a, a farm location to a more industrial setting, putting it in the packaging, wrapping it, cutting it, whatever it might be, um, and then getting it out to to the customers jointly with a legal and technical eye. Um, provided you know put together this risk management report, broke it down by these different modules. On this module, here's your biggest risk. Here's what you're doing really well, um, and then kind of took it from there and, and prepared. Um, some plans, prepared a potential statement, you know, just to have in your back pocket in case something does go bad and, and you're, you know, it, some, you're, the, you know, you're on the front page of the newspaper with respect to PFAS, you have a little bit of something to start from. Um, and then, you know, we've, we've uh, briefed the, uh, the leadership of, of that client and started really doing some heavy um, work with the supply chain, getting those certificates of compliance in there, educating their suppliers as well. So it was a non-invasive, didn't necessarily collect any data points from a lab. It was a paperwork desktop exercise with some interviews internally, but the company really does feel pretty good about understanding its PFAS risk, and it's definitely not zero, but they've looked at it, they understand the risk, um, and they're working on on keeping that risk in, a, in as small a box as, as possible. So just given, given the information today, our joint legal and technical recommendation is is working to get your arms around the risk uh, without necessarily creating other data uh, and then make your action plan based on those findings. But I think that's it for us today. We're happy to to shift and, and take questions or um, or hang yeah, on. Yes, great. Bit. Thank you, um, Alfredo and Lisa. I appreciate mm -hmm. all this important information. Uh, we did have a question come in through the chat regarding uh, styrofoam packaging, which I think is similar maybe to what you were talking about for the meat packaging, but maybe I think this is in relation to say, you know, you're at a restaurant, you get your food um, to go and they put it in a styrofoam package. Uh, is there a concern with the, the PFAS in the styrofoam? So my understanding is that unless the styrofoam has some type of a coating on it, that styrofoam is polystyrene and not, uh, a, fluor not a fluorinated compound. So the styrofoam itself is not uh, typically associated with PFOS. Okay. But again, it, it is something they should be checking with their supplier to confirm, to make sure that- In case there, if there's some type of additional coating um, or, if, or if the manufacturer is potentially using um, potential colors in the, I would go there. Like, so maybe if the, there's a pigment added to the styrofoam and that pigment has a flow agent in it and that flow agent is PFOS, but it's not, it's styrofoam is not made 
using PFOS, I guess if that's right. Right. Uh, yeah. And I think so I guess the, the question was if it is a is it a preferable uh, alternative? But I think with the way this legislation is changed, changing and, and moving forward. It yeah, it, it's one of those things where what what's the least bad option in the global environmental sense, right? Unfortunately, a lot of the you know paper based products were were made to because they were more environmentally friendly, right? It was less plastic, less styrofoam, could break down, could be compostable, and you know the straws that some people love and some people hate that are the paper based straws, less plastic in the ocean, that type of stuff with an environmentally conscious you know, goal um, end up being more of a challenge just given the their tendency to break down faster. Um, so it is a little bit of a darned if you do, darned if you don't type of thing, because, you know, styrofoam is not necessarily a great um, material for for environmental and landfill type uh, purposes, but it does take away um, a lot of the PFAS concerns. So it's it's, you know, not an ideal choice to make, but um, but still one one that is a is a consideration and the laws apply to styrofoam anyway but if you can confirm uh, that you don't have intentionally added pfas with that then from a compliance perspective of those state statutes it could be a, a relatively easy assessment as opposed to working with other materials great thank you and you know as you noted um, multiple states have different and varying levels of uh, legislation regarding uh, pfas and there are some overarching uh, federal information uh, or advisories on this. Have you, within your circles of uh, groups that you're connected to, found that there's any movement or interest on the federal side to start looking at harmonizing uh, requirements across this, you know, across the country uh, in regards to PFAS and kind of leveling out these changes from state to state? I have you know, seen kind of anecdotally some some discussion at, as a nationwide uh, stand, but I, I don't think it's anywhere near uh, realistic at the moment. And um, it's something to keep keep an eye on, but I don't think it's it's happening soon. All these state laws will will take effect uh, probably before the federal one. I mean, the ones that have passed legislation. Thank you. And do you have uh, any? resources you might be able to share what types of I, I did see in one of the prior slides uh, that cancer is associated potentially with PFAS exposure. I don't know if you have any resources where people can find more information about what the drawbacks of exposure are to the human body. You know, I think the best resource is to go to the ATSDR. They actually have a landing page on PFAS. Yeah, I All just right, posted have, one on the uh, uh, in the chat window. For, in the chat. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. That's it. That's the, that yeah. Right now. Yeah, and it, it was a lot of what we had on the slide, and they have you know the cholesterol levels, uh, liver enzymes, infant birth weight um, issues, vaccine response, uh, potential risk of preeclampsia in, in pregnant women, and um, and kidney and testicular cancers. But as we mentioned, a lot of these areas of study are early on. There's no like wow uh, study that really, really connects it without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, but these are the health effects that are, um, are kind of rise to the top of, of the PFAS concerns. Yeah, then we have one uh, last question, but I'm not sure uh, if it would be appropriate for you to ask them some of the uh, answer. The body burin slide, it, says it looks like blood levels of PFAS products are coming down. Given the bioaccumulative aspects, can you um, explain? So in the ATSDR data, that was for four members of the 14,000 member family. So, um, and those those four members have, were, have been out of commerce for in the US for 20 years. And so we would expect to see a reduction in the body burden of some of those materials. Um, it doesn't mean that we're not we're not importing articles. So hence the Tosca eight, uh, seven eight eighty eight a seven rule, um, looking at what is being imported that contains some of these historical P, PFOS and PFOA, 
and the sulfate um, and their um, right. So you look at 1999, 2000 is when NHANES first sample started sampling in the blood. Um, 2002, they were EPA um, introduced the SNR and, and banned the the further use of those materials in the U.S. And so you've seen a decline in those materials over time. Um, but we have thousands of other moieties of PFOS chemistries that um, have the persistent and biocumulative properties. So hopefully that answers your question. I think Jackie's audio went out, so I will thank you, Alfredo and Lisa, for the great information. Um, as Jackie had mentioned, we will be sending out a recording of the program, and, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody.